Hello, Joe. So how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Yeah. Excellent. Y'all set for our second guest. Who is uh, Sherry Ramsey today? I, absolutely. I'm really excited about our second guest. Welcome to the uh, welcome to the podcast, Sherry. Hi. Thanks for inviting me. One of the things that we're doing in the the longstanding two episodes so far tradition of Recreative is having the guest introduce themselves. Like normally on a radio show, you give some really pompous introduction to the guest. <laughs> but I'm interested, and hopefully Mark is as well, in hearing what our guests who they think they are themselves. So if you could just tell us a, a little bit about yourself. Okay. So, wow, this wasn't in the, uh, this wasn't in the prep notes. Yeah, it wasn't. It's, it's kind of ambushing you. Yeah. I think we're just being lazy, aren't we, Joe? <laughs> aren't we just like, like, we didn't feel like writing an introduction. So, <laughs> but I, I know where you're coming from. We want people to to frame their own experiences for themselves. That's what we're trying to do. That's right. And something else we I think we can say about this podcast is that um, it's honest. Right. So yes, we are. We're just being lazy. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. So we're being honest. So I can't make up anything really fabulous about myself. So I'm a speculative fiction writer. I am from Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, if the accent has not already given me away. So I write science fiction and fantasy. I'm what I guess what we call a hybrid author. So I'm traditionally published and I also self-publish. And I don't know, I teach a little bit of university on the side since the beginning of 2020, which was a really great time to go into something new, new experiences. Yeah, I don't know what else to say off the top. Is it fair to say you're also an artist? I mean, I enjoy your drawings and sketches. And well... I'm a hobby artist, I guess. I mean, I've, okay. I've done a little bit of digital art. I've done some book covers. Yeah, I'm, I'm a dabbler in many creative things. The weird thing is that had I actually written the introduction, that's exactly what I would have written. <laughs> I would have mentioned your latest book. I, yeah, well, yes, I do have a new book out. I have the fourth book in my Near Space series just came out from Taiki Books. It's called A Veiled and Distant Sky. So yeah, it's the fourth book in a series that I never intended to be a series, but here we are. Well done. That's great. You have written a lot of books, right? I don't know. Have I? I guess it depends on what you call a lot. Yeah. Okay. Let's say I have written a lot of books. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. I have. Yeah, because I'm just impressed because I'm always seeing like a new <laughs> release from Sherry Ramsey. And uh, and I'm always like, holy cow, I've, right. I've only written like one or two stinking books. So. I'm very impressed. I'll be fair. They didn't stink. They didn't stink, Joe. <laughs> no, no, they didn't. <laughs> Thank you. Very kind. And I guess that makes us all hybrid authors too then. Yes. Yeah. All three of us. Yeah. something we share. But I think that's kind of where the industry is at right now. So that's interesting. Too. I do too. Yeah. So what piece of art did you bring to show and tell? What did you, this is basically the adult version of show and tell, right? Right. Yeah. So okay. what did you bring? What did you want to talk about today? Okay. So, so right away. It's not something that I can show okay. because it is a piece of art that is kind of lost to me, Ooh. but it's the first one I thought of when this idea was broached. And at first I was like, well, I don't know enough about this to, to really use that, but I honestly couldn't think of anything else. So I will tell you the story of this piece of art. So in 2004, there was a, an exhibit at the Nova Scotia Museum of Natural History called Five Crows Silver. So we happened to be there and taking our kids to the museum. And so there were artworks by five different Nova Scotia authors included in the exhibit. They were all about crows or other corvids. So one of them was a painting called The Traveler. I don't know which of the five artists painted it. Although I have searched and searched online I cannot find anything about it. I can't find an image of it. I can't find any reference to it. So for me, it exists only in my memory, which anyone in my family will tell you is pretty suspect. But, uh -huh. I, know, but I know, I know I saw this painting. And it was, it was a landscape painting. And there was a crow-like figure sort of looking out over the landscape and wearing sort of a robe, a beige robe with a rolled collar, and you couldn't see the entire creature, and you sort of saw them three-quarter view, and they were looking out on, over this landscape, and it was called The Traveler. 
So in 2005, I was writing a young adult novel, which turned out to be called The Seventh Crow. And the crow in the novel, the crow character, I named Traveler because that painting had had a, such a profound effect on me. And I just had really loved it. And then later, when I was writing my Near Space series, I also modeled a species of aliens on these crow-like creatures. And the first one we meet is wearing this robe like the crow had on in the painting. But... I can't tell you who painted it. I can tell you five contenders <laughs> who painted it. <laughs> this sounds like a mystery for the group to solve. Yes. It's become a detective podcast. <laughs> yeah, it could be. It could be. Anyway, I just, I thought it was interesting because we're so used to just being able to go on the internet and find a song, a painting, a, a poem that we saw, you know, everything's out there if your Google foo is strong enough, but not this painting. I don't know whatever became of it, but I can't find it. Hmm. And there's no way to track it down. Well, I did recently email the museum to see if they might have a listing of at least the titles of the pieces matched up with the authors who were in the exhibit, but I haven't heard back from them yet. So, I mean, they may not have records going back that far. I don't know. I think that will be my last attempt at tracking it down. I would like to know who the artist was. I don't know, just for the sake of knowing. I'm sure one of the three listeners of this podcast <laughs> will take the trouble to try to figure out. That's it. Yes, maybe so. Maybe so. Go read creation team. Go. Yes, because we can't have a mystery that is unsolved, right? I love ravens and crows. And Corvids in general, I love them absolutely. Yeah, me too. Why did this painting strike you the way it did? I don't know. I don't know. There were so many. I mean, I love the exhibit as a whole. There were, there were all kinds of pieces of great art. But that's the only one that I can still bring to mind. That's the one that stuck with me. And that's the one, well, that was inspiring. And I, yeah, I don't know why. I don't know. I don't know what it was about this image of, I mean, maybe because it was a little bit speculative, right? It wasn't just a crow. It was a crow wearing a piece of clothing. So that probably spoke to me right. um, and my, you know, speculative fiction brain. And I don't know, just, just the way it was surveying the landscape and going on a journey. When you're describing it, I thought it might have been a painter I actually know. Oh, yeah. But of course it's not because I, I don't think John is from Nova Scotia. So I don't think it can be him. But I actually have hanging in my office uh -huh. at uh, Western, I have a painting called The Renegade, right. which is not dissimilar from what you're describing. It's painted in a Southwestern sort of motif. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a raven and he's wearing one of those like tall uh, top hats. Oh, yeah. That uh, I think, like, you know, that you sort of see in like Western movies, mm -hmm. like really tall ones. Yeah. And he's wearing some kind of traditional dress over top of his feathers. Right. Looking out over the distance. Yeah. And it's called, I think it's called The Renegade. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, I think you'd love it, yes, actually, because I, I think uh, I would. it sounds a, a lot like yeah. what you're describing, but I don't think John is from Nova Scotia, so it can't be him. Yeah, no, sorry. I was just going to say, none of the artists involved, as far as the press release that I was able to track down, none of them were named John. So so that can't be it. We're going to have to put the painting that Mark is talking about on the, the website for this podcast. Yeah. And and something else that we neglected to tell you, Sherry, in the uh, the notes to prepare you for this uh, podcast is that sometimes there's homework involved. I hope you're okay with that. And the, uh, the homework, this is probably coming as a surprise to Mark as well, but the homework is to, you're going to have to replicate this painting and then send it to us so that we can post that in the website as well. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and I do expect considerable detail. Right. Do you, you think you could manage like a watercolor? So this is why Mark mentioned my art earlier. It was it was a little foreshadowing. <laughs> it was foreshadowing on <laughs> yes. right. I guarantee you. <laughs> I am of course only kidding. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I could like, you know, stick figure a crow 
looking out <laughs> over a landscape. One of my favorite uh, online memes is a guy, I think it's a person in, I, I'm not sure if it's a, it's a man or who it is actually who's, who's doing it, but they are stick figure pictures of crows uh, shouting rude things. Yeah. I can say bollocks. That's one of them <laughs> with his head up. Just screaming bollocks, <laughs> which is such a crow thing. I used to have uh, my my dog, Kaylee. It's a big white Akbosh, really intelligent dog. But the crows got her every time. Right. And one day there was four of them. They they picked corners of the yard and they went. Wah, wah, and Kaylee would run at the one that was making the noise run at it, bark at it. And then another one in another corner would make the noise. <laughs> Kaylee would run <laughs> after that one. And you could tell they were just laughing their asses yeah. off. This was like, look at this stupid dog. Yeah, they probably were. <laughs> yeah, they're smart enough. So, Oh, they were. Yeah, yeah. they play. They, they, got, they, got, yeah. they got something going on. I love that they're so intelligent. I find it so fascinating. Now, Mark, our listeners don't know, but I can see both of you in video. And I think when you lean back there, you have a crow shirt on, don't you? I'm wearing a shirt that says attempted murder, and it's two crows. Wow. Yeah. Wait a minute. Did you know that Sherry was going to talk about crows? No. I had no, no idea. It's all serendipity. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Synchronicity, man. Huh. See, whereas my shirt is a blank canvas. So I was prepared for anything. You, Joe, you missed an opportunity there. You could have said, I'm wearing a crow shirt too. <laughs> oh, but we're being honest. Yeah, we're being, we're honest. being honest. I forgot that. I told you, this is an honest yes. podcast. Right. Yes, even if it's embarrassing. Damn you, honesty. <laughs> yes. Getting in the way of a good story. <laughs> now, I think we need to hear more about the books that you wrote that the crows inspired the painting inspired. Okay, so The Seventh Crow is a young adult fantasy. It's set partly in Cape Breton and partly in a fantasy realm. The main character is a girl, she's about 14 at the beginning of the story, and she lives in Cape Breton with her aunt, and she only has memories for about a year. She was in a car accident, spoiler, or so she believes. Huh. And that has caused amnesia. So one day she's walking home from school and a crow begins talking to her. So at first she thinks, oh, no, this is something else from my head trauma. Uh, now I'm hallucinating. But he convinces her that, no, everything she thinks she knows about her life is actually wrong. And there are things that she needs to discover about herself and her past. And so he kind of sets her on this path to discover the truth about her her past and her family. Does the crow reappear later as, as or is it just, he's a character? Yeah, right? he's, okay. he, he stays with her. Yeah. He's, he's sort That's of her cool. guide. Was the crow driving the car? The... <laughs> well, now I, I can't get too yeah. spoilery. Don't, don't, you don't want to spoil it. No, no, no. You're right. I'm sorry to have asked that question. <laughs> Do crows have any <laughs> special significance to you? I don't know. I mean, we certainly have a lot of crows here. I don't live in a rural area. I live in a small town, but the very rural undertones, I guess you might say. So, yeah, we have a lot of crows. You know, you grow up with the crow counting rhyme, which I assume people know. No. You don't know the crow counting rhyme? I don't know it. I'll be, I, I, damn it, I have to be honest. Damn this honesty thing. <laughs> no, I look like an idiot. Wow. What's, what's the crow counting rhyme? The crow counting rhyme is one crow sorrow, two crows joy, three crows a letter, four crows a boy, five crows silver, six crows gold, seven crows a secret that has never been told. And it does go on, but I, I don't remember the second half perfectly. I, I vaguely remember that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, crows as a portent. Mm -hmm. In the you mentioned that um, that you live in a in a semi rural town, and uh, I was born in New Brunswick and and raised in Prince Edward Island. Spent a lot of time in those uh, semi rural places, and I do remember a lot of crows. I remember being woken up mm -hmm. in the morning by crows. The window would be open because we didn't have air conditioning in the in the house. Yeah, and uh, so you had to have the windows open, and you'd be woken up at six in the morning with the. Mm -hmm. I, so I, I kind of came to hate the crows because 
I like to sleep more than crows. <laughs> yeah. Very soon now, we'll, we'll have a whole passel of young crows who will be screaming in the trees here uh, in the morning and usually at dusk. But it doesn't last for very long. But it's kind of interesting. I was gonna. I was gonna say. You got. I don't know if you guys have read my my fourth book, The Fragilarity. A raven features very significantly in that book. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and I did that quite on purpose because the raven is like this mythological character that appears in not just North American mythologies, but from all over the world. It's amazing to me how many times you see the raven reappearing and being reinterpreted by different cultures. So I just think there's something really kind of deep and mythological about crows and ravens. And I'm going to include magpies and blue jays in that too, even though yeah, they're I, the same. I think they're the same they're family. They're smart, but I don't know that magpies and blue jays are as smart as crows and ravens. I don't think so. I don't think they do the same kind of tool making things that some species of crows do. And I don't know if they have the same sense of humor that they do. No. The crows are like crows <laughs> and ravens definitely have a sense of humor. Yeah. Like it's twisted and sick, yeah. but <laughs> yeah. they've got it. <laughs> and I, I don't know why. I, I guess is it partially because they appear in so many places on the earth? Is that probably why they're in so many mythologies? Do you guys know? I think they are quite widespread. Well, you know, I was in um, Rankin Inlet not that long ago, way up north, and I was surprised, probably anybody fam- really familiar with the north would, would not be surprised, but I was surprised to see the number of ravens up there. Huge ravens mm-hmm. gathered around everywhere. Right. And I guess they, they kind of migrate. They're there part of the time, and then they, they migrate to some other place, and then they come back. Yeah. I think there's something to what you say, Mark. I encountered one of them in, in the Himalayas and it blew me away. I was just not prepared for it. It also what freaked me out at the time. I was, I guess, in a very highly suggestible mood. And we were, <laughs> Why was that, Mark? Well, how honest do I have to be? No, actually, I was mostly in a highly suggestible <laughs> mood because I was exhausted from climbing up this mountain all day. Wow. Wow. And, and we climbed to this little ledge on this mountainside. And the guy who was in charge of the uh, the trek was really interesting. He was he was half Malaysian and half Nepalese. His father was a Gurkha, and his mother was from Malaysia. And they'd met obviously while he was stationed in Malaysia. And then they'd moved to the UK. So he'd been um, raised in the UK. So he had like this weird Western patina of culture on top of all of this Asian culture. And so he said to me as we got onto this plane, so Mark, I'm not going to tell this to anybody else because they don't believe in any of this, but this is Kali's area. You don't want to mess with things. So you shouldn't eat any meat today. And I was like, what? (laughs) I'm going to have some meat. He's like, no, you shouldn't have any meat. And I'm like, oh, okay. (laughs) Because I took him seriously. And as we got to just outside of the campsite, I heard, it sounded like a raven saying mark and i looked over and i saw a raven in a tree and i went well that's weird i must be hallucinating and then he disappeared and obviously he just jumped out of the tree and fell you know just started sailing down the side of the mountain but to me it seemed like he literally just disappeared so i was like yeah okay i guess i'm definitely not having any meat tonight (laughs) so yeah for me the raven is pretty significant it's like it's it's like it's yeah yeah i mean i don't obviously it's just not real but what i experienced but (laughs) it's not a lie it's absolutely happened i was kind of hoping that it would also have seemed to have croaked no meat (laughs) (laughs) didn't need to no fabian had already that's the 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 name of this guy was fabian too which also is hilarious like he didn't need to say that because fabian already had me half freaked out and this happened i'm like all right i'm fully freaked out now and i'll tell you what lentils yeah was not enough (laughs) i'm trying to think where else in uh, literature or media crows have shown up it's I, I think there's probably too many instances of the crow and raven in their literature and not just just in literature yeah. for us to remember, let alone recite. But 
I think my first one was my my first encounter was with the trickster, which mm-hmm. is the mm-hmm. indigenous crow character, and I love those stories. They are great stories. Yeah. I think crows are often portrayed as, if not a trickster character, at least mischievous, and sometimes sometimes sinister. I mean, I guess it's the whole mm. they could peck your eyes out or whatever. <laughs> Often harbingers. They're often harbingers, I think, if you think of Poe's raven. I was just um, thinking that. You know, yep. He's not there with a happy message. No, never more. Mm. In Irish mythology. Morrigan. Morrigan, Morrigan, she's a crow. Mm, yeah. Um, and she's a harbinger of doom, right? Because mm-hmm. the ravens appeared after a battle was fought for reasons that we won't yep. get into, but everyone can imagine. Yeah. Crows and ravens being omnivores. <laughs> so if, in Irish mythology, she's quite a negative figure, whereas in indigenous mythologies, he's quite an interesting character. Yes. You know, in some ways he's he's like Loki or yes. one of those yeah, kinds of structures sure. that brings good things to humans as well as causing problems to them. Yeah. Now, do you guys like birds as pets? Um, I've never had a bird as a pet. I guess I'm not opposed to the idea, except, I don't know, I enjoy them in my yard. So I don't know how I would feel about one as a pet, more of a dog person, honestly. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that you enjoy them in your yard, because I I enjoy birds in nature. Mm-hmm. Like if I'm walking through a forest or down through a park or something, and I see a bird and I hear the call, I'm always curious, what what kind of bird is that? Now, I, and, and pretty much the only kind of bird that I can recognize is a crow. <laughs> right. But um, but I'm always curious, you know, well, gee, that call, I wonder what kind of bird that is. But I have never warmed to the idea of a bird as a pet in my house. Like you, I'm a dog or cat person. Yeah. You know, I can extend it maybe a little bit to a dribble or a hamster. Right. But that's as far as it goes. I don't want any, I don't want snakes, reptiles, lizards, or birds. They belong outside. Right. Yeah. I think that's just me. So earlier this year in, um, I guess it was in February, the uh, the great bird count happened. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with the concept of bird counts, but it's, it's like a citizen science project um, where you, over the course of a few days, um, you, t- you note the birds that are around in your area or you go bird watching if, if that's your thing and just sort of do a bird count. So I was aware that it was, was coming up. I usually I'm sort of aware of it and then I forget on the weekend. And that's what happened this time. I I knew it was coming up because I had talked to my students about it because we were talking about citizen science. Anyway, I'm having my cereal the Saturday morning and I looked out and I saw a robin and I was like, oh, a robin. And this is the weekend of the bird count. Cool. And I was thinking, I haven't seen a lot of birds in my yard this winter. Like they've been they've been kind of sparse. Um, And then a blue jay flew by and landed at the bottom of the tree that the robin was in. And I was like, wow, that that's really, that's really cool. I'm looking. And then I looked out in my yard and I am telling you, it was full of birds. There were crows, there were seagulls, there was a couple of pigeons, there was a woodpecker, there were two ducks, there were chickadees coming and going from the feeder. And I was like, uh, uh, what? Like they showed up for the bird count? Well, they probably knew it was census day. It, it, it was it was like they knew it was census day. So I, I grabbed my pencil and paper. I started jotting down everybody who was there. And I was like, no one else is awake. I can't even tell anybody this, but this is so cool. I guess there are birds around. I just wasn't noticing them. Wow. So maybe that's the point of bird counting day. I, yeah. Maybe they were trying to avoid the other bird counters and make you look good. Well. Maybe that was what was going on. Maybe so. Because birds, yeah. birds are kind that way. Yeah, that's right. I hadn't even been that diligent with feel, filling my feeders, so I don't know. Yeah, I have a feeder that I'm quite diligent about. I call it the TV programming. Oh yes, for the cat. Right. It's the it's the cat's <laughs> entertainment. So I make sure that's always full. Yeah. So they because they get squirrels is, and and it also attracts enough chipmunks. Yeah. For the stuff that escapes yeah. the bird feeder that that entertains the cats quite well. Right. But I have a strict no dinosaur policy. At your feeder? 
No dinosaurs. No dinosaurs in my because house. Because it's very important very to much. to have that kind of policy mm. because of the because prevalence of dinosaurs. Or... or you know, birds. Birds count. They're they're descendants of dinosaurs. Oh, I see. Okay. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. It's good to have boundaries. <laughs> Can't trust them ultimately. No. 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 If 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 Alfred Hitchcock taught us anything, it was that. <laughs> that movie, what a great movie to t- bring up. I love that movie. <laughs> Absolutely. And it relates to what we do, which is which is writing, because I always use that movie as an example of how to do suspense. Yeah. Mm. Do you guys remember the gas station scene in that movie? They're, they're at the gas station and the guy is, um, and to me, this is just, this is how you do suspense, not withholding information, but like presenting this information and Hitch, Hitchcock does it so brilliantly in that scene where you know that the birds are attacking people. The guy's at the gas station. He starts gassing it up. He takes out a, a cigarette. Mm-hmm. He lights up a cigarette and, and you know, that's not going to be good. And then the birds start attacking. <laughs> and just as he takes out the, the, the lighter to light the cigarette, he drops the, the, the pump for pumping the gas. There's gas all over the, the, the pavement and the birds are attacking. He drops the lighter. And it's just like one piece of information on top of another piece of information. Mm-hmm. And you can't take your eyes away from it. You're just glued to it because you know it's going to get bad. Yeah. And, and it's how is it going to get bad? You know it's going to get bad simply because you're watching that movie, honestly. <laughs> but in that scene, you're, <laughs> you're not sure how all those pieces are going to come together. Mm-hmm. You know, in what ways is it going to get bad? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And you're so drawn in. Mm-hmm. So, but excellent use of birds. <laughs> Have we uh, plumbed the depths of, uh, of birds related topics that we could talk about? I didn't know I was going to turn this into the bird episode. I honestly didn't. Well, I'm glad you did. Thank you very much, <laughs> Sherry, for uh, joining us today and for bringing your, uh, your work of art. I really enjoyed it. Nice to see you, Sherry. Thanks very much. It was it was so fun. Thanks, guys. You've been listening to Recreative podcast about creativity talking to creative people from every walk of life about the art that inspires them and you're probably wondering how can i support this podcast i am wondering joe how can i support this podcast i mean apart from being on it there's no advertisements in this podcast there's no tip jars there's nothing about like buying us a coffee or anything like that but there is a way that you can support us. And what is that? It's not about supporting us. It's about supporting the people that we're talking to. I think most of the people we've talked to are artists of some description, and they probably have some kind of artistic product that you could buy. And if you enjoyed it, maybe you could review it for them. Oh, yeah. But maybe us too. Yeah, you know what? Us too. It wouldn't hurt. They could buy our books. And how do they find us? Recreative.ca. Don't forget the hyphen. There's a hyphen in there. Re-creative. I took your line. Sorry. Well, because I stole your line. <laughs> so yes, re-creative.ca. Jinx. Oh yeah, you're, that, I stole your line again. <laughs> As well, if you like what you've just heard, you could consider subscribing to the podcast. And leave a comment if you like it. Thanks for listening. Spread the word.